Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company, a changing battlefield in these two wars that are now pending. What should we, that is the U.S., be learning from what is happening? And for this discussion, our co-host Tim Apicella uh, and Jean Rosenfeld and Vicky Caetano, esteemed guests. Thank you very much all for showing up on this show. It's an important show. Our panel is going to discuss the changes on the battlefield in the two wars that are going on, including changes in trench warfare, an old, an old notion, tunnel warfare, a relatively new notion, drones, gliders, missiles, anti-ship warfare, swarming strategies of drones and, and missiles, a war against shipping, an environmental war like blowing up a dam, a war of attrition intentionally, a proxy war with lots of players behind the scenes, human shields, using people as human shields, hostage taking and negotiating with hostages, uh, coordinated terror attacks by multiple terror groups, uh, torture and other atrocities, obviously, um, peace negotiations that go on in the press, war, legal war at the UN, the ICC, and the ICJ, cyber war all at the same time, satellite war with threats of nuclear war, sanctions war, economic, that is, symmetrical, asymmetrical propaganda, social media, and protest war in the region and beyond around the world, and so much more. It isn't simple. We're going to examine what the U.S. needs to do to deal with and adjust to these changes and keep up. And we're going to take only six hours to do this. Am I right? <laughs> Tim, why don't you give your thoughts about the scope of this discussion? Your, your lead-in is what, what has the United States or what will the United States learn about this war and war in general? And uh, I always say go back to the past, look at history, and see what you've learned from other conflicts that the United States has been involved with be it uh, the Korean conflict, which we never do call it a war, be it the Vietnam War, uh, be it uh, with the quagmire of <clears throat> Iraq and Afghanistan, those wars, and what, what do we learn? And the, the number one principle that we, we fail to learn is how to avoid it in the first place. What broke down as far as uh, diplomacy? What, what led to the conflict? Um, how could have that been altered or different so that we didn't have a kinetic war or a non-kinetic war. So what we learn is what we forget. And we got to stop forgetting how we get into these conflicts. And in the case of Ukraine, um, I'm not sure it could have worked out all that much different, but uh, there could have been some different options. Um, we just, I'm not gonna say we blindly walked into it, but uh, that appears is what we've done. And now we're in it and uh, we're in it for billions of dollars and the Ukrainian, um, the count is at least 31,000 Ukrainians have died since the uh, last two years. I'm sure the uh, number of Russians is equal to or greater than that number. And uh, that's kind of where we stand. It's a quagmire and uh, it's yet to be remain to be seen as to how this thing's all gonna settle out as far as a, a peace settlement and or uh, the, the separation of borders. You know, well, from an anthropological point of view, Gene, it seems war is a condition of humanity. It's the way it is. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. It's a sign curve, too, but it always comes back. And what I, what I find interesting about the list of horribles that I read to you is that um, those are creative ideas. Those are ideas that take a toll on the other side. Those are the ideas that spread the war, perhaps without going the the full measure of nuclear war, but um, they spread it out to so many aspects of our, you know, human relations and national relations. So my question to you is, does this change the nature of war going forward? These creative things that we have seen over the past, what, two years, um, is war different now? Will it be different in the future because of this creativity? We have seen in Ukraine particularly, but also in Gaza, a return of the level of warfare of battles we saw in 
the Great War, World War II, and even in the Korean War. But in World War II, we had specific battles in which civilians were squeezed and caught up, much as they are in Gaza, and in which nation states were overwhelmed by invasion by other nation states, namely Germany. Um, and we haven't seen this for about 75 years. So we were caught off guard. But, but prior to the war, there were high-level discussions between the United States and Russia regarding defensive postures going forward. At this time that these discussions were going on, Russia was amassing troops at the Belarusian border, just not far from Kiev. So it's very difficult to know if even at that late time, had we made an agreement on Russia's terms, which was not to move NATO closer to Russia, not to move defensive postures in the border states of Russia, and not to continue our drive for democracy and self-determination, if we could still have stopped that invasion because armies are juggernauts and you can't turn them around uh, at the last minute. So I think there's good reason to believe that Putin would have gone into Ukraine regardless. We are now in this situation, which is not of our making. Likewise, Israel is in a situation not of its making. As to how it's handling that situation, <laughs> there are different ideas about that. In terms of getting out of that situation, in both cases, there are negotiations going on. Those negotiations regarding Ukraine may not be at the level yet where important parties are at the table discussing specific things. But it's hard for me to believe that there isn't some set of plans that the United States has put forward as its position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, that it is not making some sort of initiatives about. And Putin just yesterday in his speech also made some allusions to negotiations, which is why I think he prefers Biden to Trump because he knows what he's getting when he sits down with Biden's administration. This is a, not a new type of warfare. It is utilizing the tools of World War I and World War II, kamikazes, trenches, minefields, stasis, everything to avoid the nuclear option. But there is also an interesting array of cyber and electronic modes that are new in warfare and also things to be avoided like cell phones. Let me go one step further with you, Jane. It seems to me that uh, just, just hearing you go through that, it seems to me that all of the elements that I read and all of the additional elements you mentioned are really focused on the negotiation part. Because all the players know we're not going to have a nuclear war. All the players know this is going to be resolved by negotiation. At the end of the day, you know, uh, at some point, parties are ready to really negotiate. But meanwhile, uh, as in litigation in general, you want a lot of points on your side when you walk into the negotiation. And all those points that we have been tossing, think, um, lead to finally to a negotiation. And one, I'd like to know if you agree with me. And then two, I'd like you to interpret Sinwar's remark yesterday, where he said, after the uh, 100 people had been killed uh, in Gaza, a crowd that rushed the Israeli forces, he said, now we have them right where we want them. Um, can I get an interpretation from you on that and, and whether that is consistent with my theory that all of this is directed at negotiation? Hamas made its attack from a position of weakness. It is conducting asymmetric warfare, as we have seen with terrorist groups like ISIS. Uh, the way in which terrorism works is it sends a message through violence. It sends a message to the audience, which are those that are taken unawares. 
or those that are non-combatants and are looking uh, from an observational point on the sidelines in order to win their hearts and minds and to have their narrative prevail. Everyone has forgotten how this war started in Gaza and or is just downplaying it and overlooking it. Taking this to the um, court, the international court, is a calculated move because that court is not set up to try the other party. It's not set up to try Hamas. It regards Hamas, I mean, the world regards Hamas as a Palestinian regime and a state, but in terms of international law, it can't be treated that way, so it can't be held to account. All of this is part of the propaganda warfare, which has been an element of warfare since the Cold War, especially. Um, and it is exacerbated by our tools now, which uh, are instant communication throughout the world. So it, we are in this position of the hybrid war again, where what the war of words uh, controls and accomplishes is, as Sinwar said, um, a jockeying of positions on a different battlefield, a virtual battlefield. And he feels very confident right now. In fact, <laughs> He feels confident about the Gaza war and what they want to achieve in terms of the, their future going forward. And uh, Putin feels confident about what he feels he's achieving in, in bogging down again in Donetsk and, and Luhansk. And I don't think Putin at this point has the wherewithal to go to the cities of Kiev and Kharkiv, uh, but he'd like us to think that he does. Well, Vicky, we, we talk about propaganda. We talk about um, a kinetic war versus a war of propaganda. And many people think, increasingly think, um, that, that the propaganda side of it will, will rule. And that was inherent in what Gene was saying. Um, and so there's a substantial chance here that history will see that the propaganda war is actually more important uh, than the kinetic war. It governs the, the way people react all the players. And the players on the battlefields are far wider and broader and deeper than just the ones shooting at each other. They are essentially the whole world. So my question to you, and this is a hard one, Vicky, is how do you fight back in a propaganda war that is so sophisticated and so ubiquitous globally? How does the United States fight back? Thank you, Jay. And that is a very good question. And as Jean was speaking so eloquently, uh, I was listening with great interest. And one of the things that came to my mind is, you know, in countries like Russia, China, uh, and to an extent, uh, a little bit also in the Israel-Gaza uh, war, you know, the governments there are able to rule in a much less democratic fashion than here in the United States, where the public weighs in and, and pushes forward their, their individual propaganda and interests to influence what happens at the state capital, at, uh, at our nation's capital. And when you think about our leaders facing all that, instead of being able to make decisions independent of everyone, their constituencies, comments and input, you have to wonder, is the United States in a weaker position Given our leader's dilemma in dealing with this, the public pressure, and oftentimes an ill-informed public, versus these countries that are able to make decisions without having that consideration. And they can form their propaganda solely based on the kind of messaging they, they want to put forward to their people. But in our case, it's the people in our country, which is what makes us such a great democracy, but at times it works against us because we're putting so much influence into DC and oftentimes, you know, for the individual group's benefits, huh? that it tears our, our, I think our government apart. You can see how polarized we are. And you have to wonder, will these wars get impacted depending on who the next president will be? our country. And that's a question I'd like to ask all of you, too. And, and that's kind of uh, an interesting and, and concerning issue that I would have. And let's not forget on the sideline, quietly uh, creating their own power is China and how they're looking into Taiwan. We always seem to be blindsided when things happen because we're, we're caught off guard by these things that we're not 
focusing on. But I think Xi Jinping is very happy with all this distraction. So he continues to think about what he's going to do with Taiwan. Mm. Uh, Tim, you know, we, we, we talk about um, these kinds of domestic issues and political um, arguments uh, on uh, American issues, your show. And um, you know, it seems to me that Vicky brings up a very good point, is the ability of the United States to learn from these new battlefield techniques is seriously hampered um, by our uh, political fights in the country. We're locked up on so many issues, and this is one of them. And so the other point she raises, which I would like to ask you about, is uh, we have we have a uh, such as it is a a lurching <clears throat> um, campaign combination of campaigns for president happening right right now, where people are taking positions on these wars, and I wonder your, your thoughts about how all of that rhetoric affects the ability of the United States to deal with and learn from these wars, since you have a, a debate going on between the two camps in public for those campaigns. Tim? Uh, well, let's look at uh, not only the influence of how it's impacting the United States as far as the rhetoric in both Republican and Democrat uh, camps, but also what, what Putin, Putin is getting out of this. And um, I'm sure that Putin until recent when they didn't know whether the funding was going to come for Ukraine or not, and it still hasn't, uh, I'm sure Putin is, is far more energized now to hold out and wait for the election and the election results. But as far as internally, uh, what have we learned? And that is, if you don't have a unified front when you're fighting a, a war, um, it's not going to go well. It will fray at the edges. I mean, Vietnam is a classic example of internal domestic strife against the Vietnam War that ultimately led Johnson to abandon ship. And that's exactly how it happened. It was internal strife. There was no support. Uh, you know, 58,000 American GIs died and they were coming back in body bags and mothers across the nation were, were you know, outraged and that spread. And so if you're not unified internally, you're certainly not gonna have, uh, uni you know, you're gonna be unified unified on the outside of uh, your support. And that comes in the form of Congress and funding. So Putin is happy and um, we're not looking so great right now. And I think there needs to be uh, a, a swift negotiation before something uh, for the other shoe drops, so to speak. Mm. You know, Gene, um, the, the whole world seems to be dividing in two camps. And that's a factor uh, in all of this. I mean, I, I noticed to my dismay that uh, two of the uh, terrorist leaders met were scheduled to meet today in Moscow. And then I find most, most recent news is that not only did they meet, but they met with senior Russian officials. So what you have is the terrorists meeting in Russia, I guess with Russia's permission, and then you have the meeting with Russian officials. It's part of the, hmm, what do you want to call it? I don't want to say clash of civilizations, but the axis that falls against Israel, that falls against uh, Western Europe and Ukraine, and that falls against uh, the United States. And it seems to me that these battlefield changes we're talking about are going to take some time to play out into legitimate peace talks and hopefully peace. Your thoughts? Well, just to return for a moment to what Vicky was saying um, internally, domestically, and because this is totally related to what's going on in Moscow with terrorist leaders, too, or anywhere in the world, for that matter. Yes, there is polarization, uh, probably not as much as Putin would like. He's done his, done his darndest to uh, create a, a block, uh, China and Russia and unaligned countries, North Korea, Iran, proxies like them, uh, against uh, a raid against Europe and the United States and uh, other um, countries that uh, we would include in the rubric of the West. 
But suppose back in 1935, two years after Hitler came to power and had that huge National Socialism uh, rally in Nuremberg, um, supposing um, it wouldn't have been 35 because that wasn't election year, um, Charles Lindbergh had been elected president instead of FDR. What would have happened in the next five years? That's where we are now, except the MAGA movement is much further along than the right-wing movement that nom would nominate Charles Lindbergh. Philip Roth has written a novel about what might have happened had Charles Lindbergh been elected president. And I would say that Lindbergh was not a power monger. He was the face of people seeking power in a fascistic way. But Trump's much worse. He's a power monger. And he has the same type of personality that dictators and authoritarians have. And he has a plan to replace the civil service with his loyal toadies. Now, this will put us in a very bad position vis-a-vis -vis the bloc that Russia is building along with asymmetric terrorist groups to carry out its initiatives to wear us down and undermine us. Putin felt before the invasion of Ukraine that the power of the United States was waning in the world. And Trump was largely responsible for that because he created the idea that somehow he, Trump, as president of the United States, could not support NATO, could not support Europe. And that's critical for Putin, who wants his borders to be secure from his paranoid vision of NATO coming over those borders and invading for the th third great time in history, Russia. So we have to deal that we're dealing not only with a pathological personality with Putin, but also a paranoid personality. When we say, oh, there's not going to be a nuclear war, well, the chances are there won't be if he is irritated beyond belief, but we don't have a 100% chance of that. So we know we're dealing with a very fragile personality here. Um, the use of terrorists is ongoing in Gaza. That's what started this. The axis of resistance it consists of four terrorist groups surrounding Israel that wanted to attack Israel on all sides simultaneously. And most people don't understand the uh, military aspects of that, but that is, that is the case. So he's amassing what whoever he can who's unaligned with the United States, has grudges against the United States, or feels that the United States power is waning in the world. Um, he's trying to fashion a block to unseat us from world leadership, and we need to know that. Yeah, so it's a battlefield of attrition. It's a long-term battlefield. It's a battlefield by Putin, and uh, Trump is complicit. The two of them are in a kind of arrangement together. And uh, what, I, what I see is that in the 30s, and Rachel Maddow also wrote about what happened in the 30s, we had a, a debate going on in this country. Um, there are some people like Lindbergh who wanted to join up with the Germans, uh, with the Nazis, many of them. And um, it was not clear. It was not clear which side was going to prevail until Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor clarified it politically. All of a sudden, you know, FDR could get up in front of Congress and declare war, and they would go along, mainly because everybody was in shock, like 9-11, in shock. It, that kind of shock brings people together. So if you could have a slow-rolling war of attrition using these new battlefield techniques. And you could, you know, hide behind proxies and, and do um, really dastardly things, but keep it from a level of global war, uh, just a war of attrition. Um, Vicky, what about that possibility? Will it take to get the United States galvanized, such as it was on December 7th, December 8th, 1941? Will it take some incredible disaster? some huge, you know, 100-foot uh, attack of some kind but to wake us up? Do we need to be woken up, or will we just go along with this and uh, allow it to be a war of attrition in which the United States military, 
which spends almost a trillion dollars a year of our tax money, uh, maybe going in the wrong direction, maybe unprepared to deal with a war of attrition and, and not have the political will to deal with a war of attrition? Will it take some disaster to wake us up? You know, sad to say, but I, I'm, I'm afraid <clears throat> that that's what it will take. You know, you have to look back, as Tim said, uh, let's learn from history. If the United States had not entered World War II, I don't think Europe would look as it is today, okay? I really think Hitler would have won that war and would have uh, invaded and controlled all of Europe and perhaps more. So it took the United States to get into the war. And, and let's be realistic. If you look at history, much of Americans did not want U.S. to enter that war. So it's kind of the same thing. You know, let's just take care of ourselves. It may take something very major to, one, really bring us to the reality that we need to continue to be at the table as a world power for peace in our, in our world and to bring our country uh, together because right now we are so polarized and I think it will take something major to make that happen. Well, what about the possibility of appeasement? <laughs> there, are, there are people in this country and in Western Europe for that matter and in Israel itself who would like to make peace, get the hostages back, stop the killing, um, and, and for that reason, they will, uh, let me use this expression, go to Europe, go to Munich with Chamberlain and appease in order to make peace. Is that on the table? Is that possible? I think that people who think that way, while, you know, it's noble to always pursue to peace are also not very realistic or knowledgeable about who they are dealing with. This is why I say I, it's sad, but I think it will take something very major, drastic, and painful in order to turn the course of where we are headed and in the long run create a better world. So I have so many questions for you, Tim. Oh. Um, let's do a differential, okay? <laughs> Hypothetically, suppose Biden wins. Hypothetically, suppose, and God forbid, suppose um, Trump wins. Uh, how will that affect things in both of these theaters of war? Well, I'd like to comment that um, Putin actually prefers to negotiate with Biden because Biden is more predictable. Uh, if Biden wins the election, <clears throat> I think Putin realizes that uh, support for Ukraine will continue and will not wane. That. President Biden will figure out a way to get uh, $50 billion or $60 billion to Ukraine for ammunition. And so that would prompt him to either calculate, can he sustain um, his popularity or the lack thereof in Russia for another one, two, three, four more years, or is it wise to hit the negotiation table and settle the Ukraine war once and for all? If it's Donald Trump, I think... Uh, Putin is, is very joyful about that, and he sees an opportunity for the weakening of NATO and opportunities for expansion of his borders. I don't think it's a, ma a matter of him maintaining his borders and keeping NATO away, but I think it's uh, an opportunity for him to look at uh, and lick his chops over the non-NATO countries and see what opportunities he can to take them over. As we said in previous shows, Belarus is already part of Russia now, uh, whether it's former or not. So if Trump gets uh, in the office, I think Putin is, is delighted. And if uh, Biden wins the election, I think Putin comes to his senses and realizes it's time to settle some affairs in Ukraine at least. Yeah, it's a definite element one way or the other. Um, Gene, I want to ask you a question I, I kind of was going to ask you before, and that is um, how, how equipped are we to deal with these changes in the battlefield? I think you'll agree with me. These changes are, uh, if not permanent, they they inform the future of war in in the human condition. And how equipped is the United States to stay on top of that? As I mentioned, we spend almost a trillion dollars a year on our military, um, but we still, for example, we have we have a lot of money and men and women. And, um, you know, resources invested in aircraft carriers that can be brought down with a, with a missile. 
um, or even a drone. Um, <clears throat> and so are we in the right place? Are we, are we um, dealing with these changes in the battlefield adequately? And what will it take for us to do that? Well, the United States military is already planning for changes on the battlefield as a result of what it has seen in the last two years in Ukraine. There have been surprises uh, in terms of uh, what they expected. We gave them some weapons, uh, missiles guided by GPS, only to have the Russians figure out how to jam GPS. Ukrainians, being very creative, took some older missiles, which were not with a GPS or guided system that could be jammed, and put certain types of uh, things on them that could direct them to the target. And it was the use of older methods, as well as um, newer methods, that the Ukrainians have been very flexible and, and have suppressed the U.S. military. The U.S. military has taken note that the use of cell phones on the battlefield uh, can reveal to new sources of electronic devices on the part of the enemy to uh, follow the, the movements of, uh, of us on the battlefield. So all of this is going on now. There are high level um, reports being filed and so forth. So we are taking note of the changes and incorporating them. On the other hand, in the Asia Pacific uh, uh, theater of battle, this has now become our number one concern with the rise of China in Asia. I personally feel strongly that China does not want a kinetic war. China's history is replete with the greatest loss of human life during times of war. Think of the rape of Nanking and also internal strife having to do with uprisings at the ends of dynasty. So I think we can figure out how not to go to war with China. Nevertheless, we are looking back to the World War II tactics in the Pacific. We are bringing to Hawaii um, foreign troops and planes to train. Germany is sending Air Force personnel here. Uh, European countries uh, who are aligned with us are training with us in that theater. And we are preparing, if we cannot contain China, in terms of Taiwan and control of major trade routes in the world, that we at least are prepared should anything kinetic happen. This should not deter us from producing the kinds of weapons of war that Ukraine needs. We can put ourselves on that footing now if we have a president and a regime with the will to do that and the foresight to do that and to apply what the generals here have learned from the generals in Ukraine about how to fight the type of asymmetric hybrid proxy type wars that Russia is stirring up. And the next problem area may be North and South Korea. Before, before we go uh, further on that, I just wanna ask you about the boots on the ground issue. You know, we have talked here on these shows about, you know, the, the phenomenon of, of proxy wars. And certainly you see that. You see it in both theaters, uh, where you use these non-kinetic modalities and create proxies that help you. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a matter of practical fact, at the, at the uh, negotiating table. Um, so when American leaders say we're never going to put boot, puts, boots on the ground, I guess for the while I accept that. But going forward, how are we going to change our creative style? Are we going to be putting boots on the ground? Are we going to be enlisting the support of proxies, uh, such as uh, we see Russia doing and we, and we see uh, Iran doing in the Middle East? Um, are we going to take it to another level that we have learned from these two wars in terms of, uh, you know, alternatives to boots on the ground? The trend in war today is to replace manpower with new types of devices. 
that will protect what manpower we have. So whoever seems to be most uh, innovative and ready and uh, able to apply these different types of uh, electronic warfare devices and cyber war and satellite war is going to be in a better position. I don't think we're going to put boots on the ground unless, as Vicki noted, there is some kind of shock or catastrophe like 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. Biden doesn't want war. He's taken troops out of uh, theaters of war. He doesn't. He's been extremely cautious with Ukraine. Um, he sent ships to the Red Sea, but we're being very cautious there, too. And that's not quite the same thing as boots on the ground. As for Trump, he's an isolationist. He's a fascist. He wants America uh, to be solitary, alone, and unaffected by what goes on in the world. And he wants to occupy a high-status position of power that he can flaunt. Uh, all of these men are not going to live very long. Can we hang on? For 10 more years until the situation changes. I don't know. It makes me want to live longer, what you say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Vicki, you know, we have the, this uh, uh, increase in the, the creativity of, of weapons and um, aggressive techniques, uh, as, as I mentioned out at the outset. And, and we have more players involved. And, and by that, I include national state players involved, directly or by proxy. Um, we have, you know, moving targets everywhere. Very hard to predict what's going to pop up. But would you agree with those who say that we are in, right now, a world war? And that, of course, a World War III would be different from World War II, would be different from World War I, and maybe the, the difference is greater as you go forward. Are we, do you think, uh, in or about to be in World War III? I think we're on the brink of World War III. I don't think we're quite in it yet, but I think people should recognize how fragile the situation is. And we need to act now in order to avert that in any way. And the way to do it is not to, to um, be so polarized as a country that others like Russia or China uh, we'll take advantage of our own internal um, hostility, whatever you want to call it, the problems that we're facing, to take advantage of that. Because as Tim said, if we are not unified, we cannot be uh, a player in the world uh, order of things. You know, uh, Hawaii is a little speck in the Pacific, small state, small population. Um, but the question comes up as to what an individual citizen in Hawaii can do, should do, uh, to, to solve the problems of the United States, to be um, influential in the way the United States proceeds. Do you have any thoughts about what Hawaii can do, what the individual citizen in Hawaii can do? We must recognize, while we're a small space, a state, from a position Hawaii is, from a military position, we are absolutely very key. And so I would just say that while there's no question that the military has done a number of things that it needs to clean up, specifically Red Hill and all those issues there, we must not understate the importance of the military in Hawaii for the sake of our country and the international community. And that I think many people don't quite fully understand or recognize. You're here. Tim, I think it's almost time for uh, summarizations and final comments. Uh, would you mind going first? Love to. What we've been discussing for almost the last hour now is um, how the, the battlefield has changed, how war has changed, either kinetically, non-kinetically, um, the politics now, and then the use of proxies and how that has shaped things that I agree with the panel that we are in a pre-World War III, if not already in World War III, as far as um, alignment of allies and and 
the Axis forces that we saw in World War II. Um, what we need to realize, is, as Vicky said, is that we need to be vigilant and realize what our role is as far as Hawaii and um, how significant this state is. But also as a country, we need to realize that we're dealing with forces as we did, dealt with in the 1930s. And uh, Gene, a couple of weeks ago, you, you quoted Mark Twain, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And history is rhyming right now. And we're rhyming with what happened in Germany in the 1930s, uh, domestically, between uh, Trump and, and um, Joe Biden. So let's wake up. Um, let's wake up and look at history and see how it's repeating itself almost in this country. And uh, let's be vigilant about that. Mm, uh, humanity, we kind of live in biblical times. And as a backdrop to all of this, climate change, which is the largest mm, non-human, I guess, well, it's also a human effect, um, is the most existential threat humanity has ever seen. And we see it every day in some place around the world, increasingly so. So, so Gene, can you put it in perspective for us? Uh, how much have we lost our sense of priority of humanity uh, with all these wars and with this possibility of being in a third world? I don't think we've lost our sense of humanity, but I think that we have not recognized that there is a strong force in the United States which is attempting to, to dismantle the institutions that we set up in 1789, Nine. yeah, <laughs> same year as the French Revolution when democracy was instituted into the modern world. And we have not been good caretakers lately. We've been resting on our laurels. How many kids take civics and understand, have ever read the Federalist Papers, for example, um, and, and can see what a threat, a desire for a strong man is in terms of what we will accept uh, in terms of Trump's wrecking ball to our civil service, uh, those people that spend their lifetimes being public servants to the United States, not just those that are elected, and how this is the backbone of our nation should any threat come, our ability to mobilize against anything that any other nation could do to us or any threat that we need to respond to in terms of an ally elsewhere, that is in jeopardy because of our internal laziness in not understanding that we are, in essence, the strongest nation in the world. We still are, despite the propaganda and the wishes of Putin and others, we are still the strongest military and financial power in the world with the greatest pulpit and ability to make alliances and to preserve world order. Um, unless we commit ourselves to this, no matter what our political persuasions are, we risk throwing it all away. A moment to think about that. Vicki, your thoughts to summarize the message you'd like to leave with our viewers uh, to bring all of this together and uh, look forward, hopefully, to a better time, um, but also to deal with what might be a worse time. What are your thoughts? Really, Jay, after what Gene and Tim have said, I just have to say amen <laughs> <laughs> to that, really. Especially, Gene, thank you for being on this show because I learned a lot and uh, appreciate what you said. We, uh, you know, the United States perhaps doesn't fully appreciate many in this country the power that it has and what it has, the, the, what we have done in history and to throw it all away now. Um, it's such a shame and it, it really hurts me personally and I just think that hopefully we can reverse this but I'm afraid that it may take something of great magnitude to bring us together again. Jim, you want to take one last comment? Oh, I think I've said enough. Thank you, Jay. 
<laughs> thank you, Tim Abichella. Thank you, Jean Rosenfeld. Thank you, Vicky Caetano. It's really been a very important discussion. Aloha. Thanks.